Okay, well, welcome everyone to a live coaching Q&A as part of the Academic Writers Space, and we are a virtual co-working community for academics, students, professors, anybody doing research, anybody who wants to be a more productive writer and be able to sit themselves down in a chair and actually be able to more consistently and reliably make progress. So it's kind of like an academic productivity gym where we offer writing, daily writing retreats facilitated by people like me. And one of the things we like to do once a month is also come together as a community and give people in our community an opportunity to ask questions, just spontaneously ask us coaching questions um, about how to be productive, how to focus, how to concentrate, how to be effective, how to deal with various challenges they experience in the process of either earning a degree or publishing, being productive in general. Um, in this session, we won't be answering specific like methodology or theoretical questions, which would be more of a, of a, a consulting conversation, but we are here to answer your coaching questions. And I am absolutely honored and totally delighted to have a magnificent member of our team at the dissertation coach, Kevin Hilton here today with us to uh, field your questions with you. And um, Kevin and I have worked together for, I think about five years now. And um, uh, he, I will say, has single-handedly, I think made it possible for many people to actually finish their dissertations who were really not receiving the level of support that they need. If you're out there and you're watching this video and you feel like you are an academic orphan, you are not alone. And I think that's kind of one of the things that people don't realize is that it feels like something's wrong with them when actually what's wrong is the context, is that it's very difficult to do this work without a quality of something that's kind of like caregiving, support, guidance, feedback, direction, input. Without that, it's a very lonely and challenging journey. And Kevin has been a great partner to many people who have been orphaned <laughs> for a variety of reasons um, and been able to help them actually successfully get their degrees and move forward in a positive way. So Kevin, I don't know if you wanna just say a quick hello and you can, you can stay off mute if you want, Kevin, too. Um, Oh, I wasn't know that I was still on mute. I'm oh, sorry. okay, no problem. Oh, <laughs> welcome. Thank you. No, welcome, welcome. Glad, so, so, so happy to be here. Um, uh, just short of just saying, I enjoy uh, what I refer to as journeying with people, right? You pick an important topic and sometimes you might get lost along the way. And so I just get incredibly excited in whatever ways that I can support, just largely because I'm I would characterize myself as a polymath of sorts, right? So I find just about everything under the sun interesting and fascinating. <laughs> and so I try to bring that energy when I'm working with others on their topic. So I'm here today to share, but in the same vein, learn as much from you. And as just feel free, as I frequently tell the folks with whom I work, there are no stupid questions, right? This is the space where you get to be incredibly vulnerable mm -hmm. and say, I don't know, or I'm curious and just flow with it. Mm, yeah, that's a really important tenet. Um, I think it's often missing in a lot of academic environments is the idea that there's no such thing as a stupid question. And oftentimes we do have questions that we, you know, where we don't know where to get the answers. And, and, and there is no such thing as a stupid question. It's just, if you don't know something, it just means you haven't learned it yet. It's a, it's, I think it's a much healthier way to define it. So, um, well, I want to give everyone a chance to think about what are some questions they want to ask us. And while you're thinking of that, I'm going to, I actually had a question I wanted to ask Kevin, um, just to kind of hear his vantage point um, after all these years and so many, uh, such a large number of students that he's worked with. And, but feel free to go ahead and start, you know, putting your questions into the chat. Um, but we'll give you a little chance to warm up here. So, um, Kevin, I know that you've worked with students um, in a wide range of programs, students in um, traditional like brick and mortar institutions, students in online programs, students doing degrees overseas um, and um, facing all kinds of challenges. And I was just curious, when you look across the various um, folks that you've worked with, and I think this also, what I'm about to ask applies even if you're post degree and now you're working and trying to publish and be productive is what is it that you see are some of in a sense kind of the secrets of success the strategies the approaches um 
like what's the difference between the folks who really are able to find a more consistent groove um, than the ones who struggle more, where it's a where it's a m much more arduous journey. I mean, just in terms of what you see that they're internally generating that you think is making the process work for them. Great question. So one of the ways in which I try to explain writing, be it dissertation or post dissertation, it's almost like if you have made a commitment to say I'm going to lose some weight, right? And I'm going to be going to the gym. You have to stick to that. I mean, I used to feel like, well, you know, you can't, you know, and as with anything, it's, it's tough getting started with writing. It's tough making the decision to go to the gym. But once you sort of get it, you have to find that groove by either setting some, setting some goals. I'm going to go every day. I'm going to do this once a week, twice a week, whatever it is. And by way of context, I frequently have students who are candidates who have been stuck for five, seven, eight years. And one of the first thing that I typically suggest is let's start with setting some goals. They don't have to be big ones. It could be little ones. I'm going to commit to writing a paragraph each week by Sunday, right? Or it might be an entire section or it could be, you know, an entire a chapter in a month. I typically suggest avoiding big goals because they become really scary and will sort of prevent you from just taking baby steps when in many instances that's what you need. So in the context of those folks that I get that have been kind of struggling for five, six, seven years, I have found that if we can commit to setting even minor goals, baby goals as I like to call them, literally within a year, um, I've seen them, uh, folks who have gone from proposal to full-fledged defenses, dissertation defenses, just simply because they've gotten themselves in a place where they're going to treat this just like anything else that they deem to be important, their job, their family, their kids, and they're going to make that commitment no excuse. It used to feel terrible saying that because it's like, well, you know, people have things that are occurring in their space, and that is indeed true. You're never doing any of this in a vacuum. There's just all kinds of incredible things that are gonna come up, but in the same vein that incredible things come up in the spaces in which you live and work and you find ways to sort of navigate that, I try to encourage people to sort of adapt that, uh, you know, a similar approach. Mm -hmm. And I find that that seems to work well. Well, um, it's such great advice. Um, I think for people is we have to move it to the front burner and we have to do it regularly. Um, and actually like anything in life, if you want to get better at something, you, you do it a lot. You have a lot of practice, right? Um, so it's, it's, and, and we know right now, you know, right now, you know, here we are in September, 2020, um, it is a, can be quite a challenging time for many people when we're all at home. Some of you may have children at home who are schooling and uh, life is not the way it used to be. Where, so putting it on the front burner might be challenging. But I think, Kevin, one of the points that you made that's really important is that so in a sense, something's better than nothing. Like you don't underestimate the impact of doing a little bit of work very consistently over time. Many of you might have heard of the Pomodoro technique where you work in these 25 minute increments. Um, it's called like a tomato, the tomato technique in a sense where you, one tomato equals 25 minutes. We've had clients who, based on their lives, I'll never forget I worked with someone who um, was a pastor of a fairly large church and he had four children. <laughs> and he was doing a dissertation. And he did about one tomato a day, most days, for very long stretches of time. But he did that tomato a day. And you know what? The first, after the first week, six weeks of working with me, he was sort of stunned to see that six weeks of less than half an hour a day was incredibly cumulative to something he would have never believed and he was really resistant to my, well, let's just have you do one a day, like super resistant. But I just told him, this was one of the, I told him, you know, from Karate Kid, wax on, wax off. Like I told him, I'm telling you, this is one of the situations where I just want you to do what I'm telling you to do. <laughs> Even though I, you don't believe me. And it, it did pan out. And so, I mean, I 
always remember him because he pretty much did his entire dissertation a tomato a day and every once in a while he'd have a breakout day where he would do before between like four and eight you know a little bit 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 starts to add up to something fairly substantial now i don't know that that would work for most people it would not work for me but don't underestimate the power of doing something on the days where it's really challenging, where you, you know, it's, it, we want to get ourselves there. The other advantage of that also, and I think this is probably one of the, the people who do put it on the front burner, here's something else that starts to happen. It's in your consciousness. So now when you are not working on your academic project or your book or whatever you're working on, because you're touching it more frequently, it's, it's, it's swirling around, ideas happen. You spontaneously realize, oh, I know what to do there now, even when you're not working on it. And the other challenge is, is that writing is a lot like a swimming pool. When we touch the writing frequently, it keeps the heater on the pool sort of on overnight when we're touching it regularly. But every day we don't touch the writing, the pool is dropping a degree or two. And so it's going to get harder and harder to get back in. And that's why if all you do is just reread something you already wrote, uh, two minutes, do something to touch it on a day where the day is getting away from you, because it'll increase the odds that you might be able to get more deeply into it the next day. Make sense? If I could add. To, to, to that point, I think often people come at this in terms of this feeling of I have to write something perfect or monumental on that day. And the challenge is always just touch it, get something out. Uh, you may recall that experience we had with that, you, that, that client last week who says, I'm sending you my ugly, ugly duckling. And it was send the ugly duckling. An ugly duckling is better than no duckling at all, <laughs> right? But the idea here is to get in a space where you writing, and from an academic standpoint, is incredibly. Um, it comes with its challenges, right? And so when you say to someone, "I wrote a paragraph today," for those of us who are writing in this space, we know how long it actually took to write that paragraph. This is in creative writing. And so I encourage people to embrace that type of thing, that it doesn't have to look pretty, but as long as you're touching it, as Allison says, in one way, shape, or form, mm -hmm. it keeps it warm and it keeps it going and it, the momentum will build over time. Exactly, exactly. And I think that's, a, Kevin, actually a great segue to one of the questions we got. Um, it says, I find that I get very anxious when I write. Any suggestions on calming myself down? Um, well, there's probably lots of suggestions we could make, but I think one of the things that is so often happening is what Kevin was just talking about, is that our standard or expectation for the quality and or quantity of work we expect ourselves to accomplish in a given work session is usually wildly unrealistic. Say that again. <laughs> right? It's usually wildly unrealistic. It's, it's, it's this, uh, Kevin, you mentioned this to me. Uh, I'm going to write a lit review this weekend. No, you're not. Remember what so often happens is we go back in time and remember times when for a course, we wrote the paper the weekend before it was due, you know? And, um, the thing is, is that paper was being read in comparison to other papers written the weekend before it was due. It's a completely different animal than the dissertation, right? So, so often I think we think that in order to deem ourselves smart, worthy of being, you know, in the position we're in, um, good enough, you know, worthy um, to not feel like an imposter, well, if we can meet this mark, well, then that will mean I'm good enough. Does that make sense? Um, but it's a setup. You're literally setting yourself up to feel anxious, stupid, like a loser, inadequate, overwhelmed, frustrated, impotent, 
you know, like you don't feel like that you have that potency to actually be able to sit down and accomplish something because the standards are just way too high. We would not expect, you know, a school age elementary school child to be able to sit down and do algebra problems. But there is a way in which there's kind of an equivalency that we expect of ourselves. So I think starting to have really have much more align um, expectations that are much more humane can really help uh, the anxiety. The other thing is, is to pay really attention to when you're writing, how are you actually talking to yourself? What is the messaging that's going on? And I encourage people to start to keep a file. If you notice that you have a lot of um, anxiety or stress or difficult emotions is to keep a little um, file could be electronic or, or on in a journal of my mind is telling me we want to start to be able to hear what is my mind telling me the what your mind is telling you is usually um when we're obviously when we're anxious is sort of a fear-based you know this this something's wrong you've got to protect you've got to stay vigilant what if this isn't good enough and um what happens is, is that we, we have these thoughts and then we would do what we call, we blend with them. We become them. They're, the fact that my mind is telling me that there's a, I might not be good enough or smart enough or I don't have enough time or whatever it's telling me, we blend with it. And one of what we need to learn to do is to separate from it and have an awareness of, oh, my mind is telling me this. Um, okay, but... And in a sense, to in a sense, find kind of the inner nurturer in you that's going to soothe, soothe that voice in you that's so frightened and so anxious. You know, um, I also think there's all kinds of things that we can do, which is do things like start to create an, an environment. I spoke about this in our writing retreat yesterday. Um, you know, lighting a candle. Uh, people have talked about putting on different kinds of music, doing things that signal to you and to your um, nervous system, we don't need to go into fight or flight to get through this. Okay. Now, most of us have gotten through difficult things in life by using an enormous amount of sympathetic nervous system stimulation, just automatic, right? We go right into that fight, flight, or freeze state. But the problem with that is that when you're in fight or flight, your whole system is waking up and orienting to survive, not to create, not to think deeply. So, um, but it's, I actually, I mean, I, I can't say this is like true, but in my experience, having, you know, worked with students for about 20 years now, and, and even in my own personal life, I think that um, it's almost an addiction we get a certain thrill off of running on adrenaline, you know, like that, that in some ways adrenaline is the true drug of choice <laughs> over caffeine or any other, you know, uh, substance is I know how I'll get myself activated. I'll just scare myself into action. You know, does that sound familiar? It, and it, and it, and it actually does work, but at great consequence to our physical and mental well being. And ultimately, I believe uh, it really undermines our capacity to live out the intellectual potential that we desire to. You, that we cannot really do the work that we are truly capable of if we're not ever in a state of more of rest. Like this sounds weird, but I don't mean rest like you're napping on the couch. I mean you're in a more rested parasympathetic, parasympathetic state and you're working. And that's a territory to begin to explore, which is how do I find ways to calm and center myself, whatever that is, um, so that I, and I keep reminding myself, hey, I don't have to terrify myself into productivity. That's actually not working for me, right? Um, so, but I, I, I do believe that we also have to recognize is that the physiological signs of anxiety, the tightening in the chest, the heartbeat racing, the muscle tension, 
All of those things, remember, that's just part of your sympathetic nervous system. That's designed to help you survive a mortal danger. And so when, when you feel the symptom is anxiety, we want to say, oh, oh, there, oh, look, my sympathetic nervous system is working. Good. If a tiger jumps out behind a bush, I'll be, I'll be able to survive. Cool. But what, where I think we often get into trouble is we interpret the, the physiological arousal of the sympathetic as, indicate, as, as indicative of the fact that there is a danger when there isn't. That's what panic disorder is. It's where you become profoundly, deeply terrified of the physiological changes associated with the sympathetic nervous system. So part of we also, I think to, to answer your question to calm the anxiety is to say, oh, look, my sympathetic nervous system is working. It's stimulated. And um, I've got to find ways to stimulate the parasympathetic, which is what, which is, what is like the rest, renew, heal. It, it's, it's when you, I'll tell you a couple of times when you probably have felt it. If you've ever had a really great massage afterwards and that state of kind of peace that comes over that's the parasympathetic nervous system has been really highly stimulated or when you go on vacation and you you know you have your whole journey on the airplane and you finally get there and you get to this really cool resort or space you walk in your room and you see the view and you go yes that's that parasympathetic so we we know what it's like it's just way under stimulated and, and leaves us so vulnerable to just kind of living in a chronically anxious state, which really undermines our capacity to do what we're capable of. So I hope that answered your question. That was a very long answer to your question. But I know for myself, running a business, raising a family, now starting a new business, every single day, I have to work with the fact that I do have a sympathetic nervous system hardwired into me and notice the tendency to want to use adrenaline to get through the day. I'm so talented at that, but it does not serve me. <laughs> All right, I have to keep actually, uh, one of the things that I do is when I notice I'm in that mode is I actually back away and just like walk a couple loops in the house, drink a glass of water, and see if I can almost come back into the work at a different angle that's calmer and more serene. Um, and I think with practice, I'm getting better at that. I hope that answered your question. Um, all right, I just wanted to read Aunt, this one longer question here. Um, okay, I have some new and progressive ideas on grief resolution and will be doing my dissertation to add to the body of knowledge regarding organizational bereavement support for direct care workers. My chair says as long as it's grounded in the literature, which it is, but sparsely, it will align with my degree, degree program, organizational leadership. My question is, how do I give myself permission to fully embrace this topic that is my passion without coming across as being too personally involved, um, which I have, you have been impacted personally um, by this, uh, and all, all it sounds so all of your family has passed away. That's a really good question. And, and Kevin, I wonder if you have actually encountered this with students who are really on a very a personal level, highly invested in their topic, yet need to retain a sense of like, uh, you know, of that kind of researcher distance and professionalism. So I don't know if you want to, I want to let you comment on that first, because you probably have seen this firsthand. Yeah, so it's a really, really great question. And, you know, I find that in many instances, people select topics that are really near, close uh, to them. And especially if they're doing a, a qualitative study, that's something often that they have to be mindful of, right? How do I maintain some level of objectivity, right? And you know, the science of it says you do these kinds of things. And it's a tricky balancing act because depending on the nature of the topic or the study, if it's, if some of them may have traumatic implication for the person who's doing this. And so how do I manage that? So I'm interviewing someone, for example, and I don't fall apart in the middle of it because they're saying things that are triggering emotions or um, making me think about something that I went through that was unpleasant. Or in an instance, sometimes I might have clients who have become so attached 
to the participants that they're interviewing because of the nature of the topic. So much so they carry that even into the analysis to say, I don't want to leave out anything that anyone has said, or I want to make sure that I, and I have to remind them, there's a lot of strength in being close to it because it allows you to understand and relate to the person in a very intimate way to know how to probe, what to ask, what to explore. And there's value in that, a tremendous amount of value where you're not so far removed from the lived experiences of the persons with whom you're interviewing or collecting. But in the same vein, you have to find a way to develop that skill set of saying, when I'm in this space, I have to kind of switch on that objective hat. Not easy to do, but I'm trying to speak to both sides of it, which is it's great to have it because it allows you to probe and understand in ways uh, for persons who are so far away that you'll get it. On the flip side, you can deal with the objectivity of it because in most research setting, they'll give you a series of steps that you could take from your field notes and uh, I forgot, I'm forgetting some of the terms off the top of my head that you could use to keep track of the extent to which you're remaining as objective as possible. Journaling is one of them and there are different forms of that, which gives you time to kind of go back and reflect to see what you're journaling about. And you can get to ask yourself, am I being objective here in terms of how I'm approaching either my data collection, the analysis, and ultimately even the write-up as a whole story. Mm -hmm. And I would add to what you're saying, Kevin, is that, um, <coughs> excuse me, um, I think you have to know when you feel like you're getting too personally involved, you'll know it, <coughs> excuse me, um, and um, get support, talk it through. Obviously, something's welling up in you that needs an outlet, if that starts to happen. <coughs> Great timing that I've just developed a cough. All right. Um, while I work my cough out, Kevin, I'm going to send this question to you, but I have some thoughts about it too. Um, how does one juggle successfully teaching, including prepping, grading, meeting with students, and writing for publications? It's hard for me to leave one cave and enter into another without the privilege of spending too much time on one or the other. On the other. So hard to write research during the semesters. I think a lot of people who teach struggle with what's the balance of how much time do I, do I dedicate to the preparation and the grading and the attentiveness of my students, but I also have my own research and writing and publishing that's important to me. Um, how, how do I travel between those domains and not feel like I'm neglecting either one? Is it, you know, I, I think is in essence your question. Um, I don't know, Kevin, if you have some thoughts about how, how you've seen academics successfully juggle that, that challenging. Yeah, that is really, um, I'll even add some additional layers to that, right? Making time for your family, for example, right? And have, having to do all of those kinds of things. It's the science of compartmentalizing things. I don't know that I have a magic bullet for it, right? Short of saying, um, you know, as you're scheduling your time and your events, if there's room to create enough space between each of them to sort of decompress is what I like to call it, right? Because if you're sort of jumping from one to the other, I, it, it's hard to make that transition. I, I know of no one who makes that smoothly without saying, um, even for me and in interacting with clients, I try as best as I can to even have a brief amount of time in it to make the transition so that way I'm not bringing that energy because some of it is an en energy thing I'm bringing this energy from here or some experience that I'd had in that space into this new space and that type of thing and so what I find that works is if you could create a cushion in between and just get allow yourself to breathe do some other things whatever that thing is that sort of detoxifies you or any of the other words that you'd like to use and not bring that in um, try not to pack as much in in the day. I know that's easier said than done for whatever it's worth. I do this. I also teach as well. And so I totally get the, you know, navigating multiple space. But you have to just find a way to create a little bit of room between what you do. And if it's feeling overwhelming, it's okay to hit the pause button, right? And say, let me just step back for a minute, process that. 
and give myself a little bit, you know, be kind to myself is what I call it and say, you don't have to keep running like that. And if you're exhausted, it doesn't mean you're a failure or that you're not working hard enough. You're at the end of the day, you're human and mm -hmm. it's a normal part of our, our, our experiences. And I think that, um, Kevin, one thing that I thought of when you were talking is that um, it's really important to be very mindful of how you, as the instructor, design and set up the course in the context of a being a professor, a teacher, who is also trying to publish. Right. Though sometimes what happens is people design the syllabus the, the amount of uh, short papers or quizzes or exams, how much they're going to be available, how much interaction there's going to be, absent the awareness of the human being who's going to be doing all of that is also trying to publish. And so how important it is for there to be that awareness going into the semester from the jump. Because what I do find also, this is an interesting parallel to what we were talking about with anxiety one of the things that can happen is that we um, really overdo it. We give the students too much reading. We have too many, um, you know, little, what do you call those papers? Like reaction papers. Remember I, in grad school, I had classes where every single week I had a reaction paper due, you know, and it was, it was, it, it put too much pressure on us. And to be honest with you, I don't think that we read the articles in as much depth and learned as much. So sometimes it can feel like we need to compensate for our perceived inadequacies by putting on this life altering, incredible course that we have so much to offer the students and we're so accessible and available, but it actually completely undermines the other part of us that wants time to you know, work on your own, to have your own world of research and thinking creativity. So now it may be too late to go back and do anything about the current course you're in. That's just something I think to think about for the future. Um, I do think there, I like the actually that you use the word cave because there's something about knowing that you are surrendering and giving yourself over when you're when you're in teaching mode versus when you are in you know writing and research mode that there's a a letting go and giving yourself really permission to only be doing one or the other and um listen here's the reality of life we can only do so many things and if there is a group of people that i've ever seen struggle with the fear of missing out it is academics. They get asked, oh, you want to be on this research project? Oh, do you want to do this? Do you want, and then, yes, 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 yes. Uh, we have had a contract for a few years where we do faculty development work and every single professor we've worked with, this is one of the fundamental challenges they have is that they can't move anything forward because they've said yes to everything. So in some ways, what they've said no to is being productive with a particular project. You know, so um, actually in this upcoming week, our, the theme, by the way, for the retreats this week is boundaries. So it's, a, I think, a really important topic. Um, and someone said yesterday on a retreat, because I, I was talking about this concept of flow being like a river. And he said that, you know, a river has to have banks. Otherwise, the river would just, you know, run out. All, it wouldn't be a river anymore. We have to have some kind of bank, some kind of boundaries around how we teach, what we agree to research-wise, what we prioritize so that we really, and it might, it might actually help you to pare back, look and see what could be pared back right now without doing harm to the students or to my research. What can I pare back so that I'm really clear on what the front burner priorities are and that, that I have more permission to move between those things because I've named them the priorities. I'm not, my energy and my focus isn't just sort of um, spread out over too large a surface area where I can't be potent in any particular area, you know? I was gonna add, because I think that's next. I literally was having this discussion with someone yesterday to the example that you gave Allison, right? In terms of how we, no one tells us how to design 
of course. And there's some academic institution where it's preset, but if you're at a place where you get to design it, you know, I've had to encourage the person to work smart, right? So a typical example for a learning platform, you know, do multiple choice quizzes in there, or instead of giving papers, make them group assignments. And you're doing this in a way that still allows you to assess, freeze up your time to publish or to work on your dissertation. The conversation that I was having with this person, they were complaining about not having enough time to focus on publications for their tenure position and had just designed these courses in a way where they were feeling incredibly overwhelmed, teaching three courses with 20 students in each and just being, feeling overwhelmed, always grading and not knowing how to make the time. To the point that you made, can't change it now, but in the future, you know, think about how to design your courses in a way that still allows you to meet the objectives, still be there and fair to your students in terms of giving them what they need, but allows you to just recognize, you know, you need to move as fast as you can, but you can only move as fast as you can if you create the space that allows you to do that. Yeah, it's, it's really true. And I think that we, um, we have to exercise the capacity to be, instead of a time manager, and many of you have heard me say this before, time cannot be managed. It is indifferent to your opinion of it. But what can be managed are the promises, commitments, and agreements you make. And so often, by the way, that we're caught in this chronic fight or flight that we were talking about earlier is actually a function of that we've not been conscious that a key role we have in our own lives is to be a commitment manager. And so I, I have been asked many, many times over the last 20 years if I would do a workshop on time management. And the answer is no, I will not. Because I haven't figured out yet how to help anybody manage the fact that there are 60 seconds in a minute and 24 hours in a day, right? Um, it's much more potent and, and, and for me to think of it as, well, what am I actually agreeing to? And how, how have I ended up in a situation where I have more every single day to do than, I, than a human being could possibly do? You know? And it's easy to set ourselves up. Oh, sure. Like, sure, I'll do that. So if someone asks you to be involved in something, that in and of itself can seem so doable. But everything that's let in, like everything that you allow and you say yes to, that, that crosses the boundary, has to be evaluated in the context of everything else you're already committed to. Does it work in that context? And often um, times the answer is no. <laughs> it, it does not, it does not. Um, Feel free to keep putting your questions in the chat. I had another one that I actually wanted to, um, to bring up to Kevin. I mean, it's interesting, you know, Kevin and I in our, in at the dissertation coach, we work with lots of students who have been attending online universities, universities that never had face-to-face -face classes or have moved to largely a uh, virtual experience of getting a doctoral degree which is quite different than the programs where, that Kevin and I attended, where um, we were in a more traditional brick and mortar institution. Um, we, we knew the people on our committee. When I defended my dissertation, I didn't actually realize this till a few years ago, but I was thinking about, there were five people on my committee. I had been to the homes of four of them. I had met their families. I'd had dinner at my chair's house multiple times. I knew his wife and his children. Um, it's very different to do a dissertation in, a con in that relational context where you bump into people in the hallways. You know, oh, look, Jim Kelly on my committee, his office door is open. I poke my head in. Hey, Jim, do you have a minute? I wanted to run something by you. Very, very different. Now, of course, right now during this time of COVID, <laughs> Even the traditional brick and mortar school, I think everyone's getting a taste of this kind of virtual experience of being advised. What Kevin and I have noticed is that um, faculty seem to have even retreated, what, regardless of the institution, have retreated. There's less engagement, less involvement. And I just wanted to know, um, Kevin, what kind of advice you have and how you support your clients to work with people who aren't really providing feedback, 
who aren't responding to emails, um, who aren't actually giving a lot of direction. If you've seen ways that, that students have been able to get faculty to engage with them, to get on their, kind of get on their calendar, you know, um, get their attention again and get them to engage that, that are effective as well as things that you see students do that are actually counterproductive or ineffective with faculty? Yeah, great question. And I could relate to what you just uh, described. I recall driving to uh, work some mornings when I started to work and I could stop by my chair's house in the morning to drop off my paper version <laughs> of my dissertation and say hi to the kids and you know, got to know them on a real personal level. But in the same vein, that very chair would remind me that you know, working on a dissertation is the loneliest journey known to mankind, right? <laughs> and I said, how ironic is that, right? And that has been amplified even more, right? The sense of isolation and lonely, you know, you're sending in things for your committee to read, you're not getting it back for a few weeks and you're sort of in limbo waiting for things to occur, right? It's what I like to characterize, and I think you do this as well, is you know, how do you manage your committee or your chair and your advisor, right? And I think part of what I found is that you have to find a way to um, stay engaged. So this might be emails or ways to constantly ping them, right? Just like touching your dissertation every day. If you're just doing it once in a while, then it's really easy to go, I'll get back to you, right? So I had a client last week who was working her way up to a defense and I kept on saying, is your chair aware of this thing or that thing? She's like, no, he never reads my stuff. He never has time. It's like, well, we're gonna prep for this. This is the week we're gonna get him to respond, right? And we're gonna do it thoughtfully in terms of how you compose the email and the kinds of questions that you actually pose to your chair. And sure enough, he was incredibly responsive. She said, I've never seen him this responsive before. Right. In a virtual space, the reality of it is faculty, I think the demands of teaching classes, just like, you know, for those of you who are doing that committee membership and other types of things that's occurring. It's real easy to sort of put you to the back burner if you're not touching them often. So whatever ways in which you can find to creatively keep them engaged. So that way you're always at the top of their email, not in a way that's pesty or anything like that, but meaningful, thoughtful. I know you're incredibly busy. I'm stuck here and I was wondering if, or, you know, I'm at this phase and I'm uh, wonder, you know, any which way you can. I've just updated this section. Can I share this with you? Even if you don't really need the feedback, it's constantly staying present is one of the things that I think has, I, I've seen works um, um, best in this kind of situation. Mm -hmm. And um, I, Kevin, that's such good advice. I think, um, one of the things that's also really important is that when you are reaching out because you're stuck and you're needing support with something, reach out in a way that demonstrates your meaningful intellectual engagement in solving the problem. You're not communicating, I'm stuck, help me, you know, solve it for me. You're communicating, I'm struggling with this. On the one hand, I've been thinking about going in this direction. I've, you know, demonstrate that there's been some thought to solutions, there's some action and momentum. I mean, I do think keeping faculty apprised hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times over the last 20 years, a student gets on the phone with me for the first time and I'm sorting out what they need and figuring out how we can help them. And one of the first problems we're going to have to deal with is they have not talked to their chair in over a year. And now as every month travels by, they become more and more fearful of getting engaged. So that's something really to try to avoid is getting in a situation where you are not making contact that will not serve you well, you know. Um, I also just want to say one quick thing about sometimes the lack of engagement with the faculty is something that um, it, you, that you, you, you cannot get them to engage. We have seen students where no matter what they do, they just don't get a response. They will send in a version of the dissertation and six months will go by with no, no acknowledgement of receipt. If that's happening, it's really important for students to document. If, if you see a pattern emerging of non-responsiveness, not getting the support you need, 
document in a very factual way. You know, on September 15th, 2020, I submitted a draft and then, you know, record what happens because it, there are times where students do need to go to a dean or to another the chair of the department or someone and in a very factual way be able to show here's what's been happening. I need support to move my dissertation forward. I'm actually not getting any, um, I'm not getting the feedback, you know, um, and that does, that does happen, you know, sometimes. Um, all right, we've got a few things going on here. Okay. Um, all right, I have a very demanding day job and working on dissertation after work and on weekends. I'm working on setting better boundaries at work, but more of a concern right now is there are some major staffing shuffles happening on my committee. And as a result, I have to defend my proposal by the end of October instead of mid-December. I'm realizing that I've been working so hard that I'm starting to burn out and I've to keep I have to keep going till October. If I don't, it's likely I won't be allowed to finish because I'm up against a time limit. Any tips on working hard, maybe even so hard that it's in the realm of magical thinking, we know that, so that I can accomplish what I'm being asked to but avoiding burnout. Well, that is a tough situation to be in. Um, first of all, there's one thing I would say about when this happens with a committee and a shuffle. I don't know if you're chair or someone. Sometimes what happens is there's, there's an awareness that the student is going to do the best that in your situation she can, given what's going on. That's beyond your control. So one thing that can help to take a little bit of a pressure off is kind of a, an agreement that you may have to make some revisions after the proposal meeting, but you're just going to do the best you can between now and then, right? Um, another question I have for you would be, if, is it possible to go to whoever your manager or boss is explain the situation and get even an extra personal day, even, even two or three three-day weekends could make an enormous psychological difference, you know, if it's possible, to, or to find a way to have some half days or to have someone else step. Is there some way that you can get a little bit of space and room in your work that might give you some breathing room? Um, I think another way to create space is to actually start to show up and really coach yourself. Okay, you're kind of, you're, you're up against the clock and you are needing, um, in some ways, it's almost like you're needing some parenting or coaching from a really awesome parent or coach who's like, you know what? Yeah, this is tight. This is tough, but you can do it. All right, what are we going to do today? What's the game plan? I'm here for you. Literally, there's a part of you that's showing up and really coaching and supporting that other part of you that feels so vulnerable to burnout, who's kind of almost holding you and carrying you through one day at a time. Um, I do think it could be helpful for you to have a master plan where you figure out, okay, where, since we don't have a lot of time, where do you need to be by the end of this week, next week, the week after? So it's really clear what you're asking yourself to do, and then you're aiming just to do it to the best of your ability. Um, another thing that can be helpful, and you, I would talk to your chair about this when I've seen students in a situation like yours, is to actually write a cover letter to the committee where it's very clear what you're giving them. And if there are things that you know will need to be further developed for the full dissertation. Because, right? That might be another way that you can take some pressure off. Um, and by the way, just want to segue back to our last question. Don't submit things to committee members with no cover letter. You're going to be so much more likely, to Kevin's point, to get their intention engagement if they get like a, you know, I'm giving you my dissertation. Here's or the chapter two and three. Um, let me tell you about some of the changes I made it. I'm, I um, let them know specifically some things that you'd like their feedback on. That's on page 17. You know, make it easy for them to step up and engage with you. Um, but also, I think cover letters to committee members before a proposal and a dissertation defense meeting is so it's also just a way of minding the relational field that is there. And sometimes it's actually a little bit absent where you're 
politely inserting yourself and saying, here's what I'm giving to you. I look, you know, I look forward to my defense meeting. Thank you for being on my committee. You'd be amazed at how few people actually do that. So you stand out when you, when you do that, right? Um, but I just would encourage you to look for us. Where are there some pockets of space? Also, is there anything you can do? Like you order more meals, hire some household help. I mean, maybe you can't do that because of COVID, but are there, is there any way that you can get some extra help, some buffering to help protect you? And the last thing I would say is remind yourself, this is, this is an intense few weeks. You can do it. You can make it through it, right? You have lots of writing retreats to support you, meanwhile. Um, Kevin, I don't know if there's anything you want to say about... You, you I, sure, I think you hit it right on, right? So I would start by saying, let's work backwards in terms of what are the dates and what can I realistically hit. And literally say, this is a proposal. This isn't your final dissertation. So in many instances, you can turn in something that's not 100% complete, right? It's, and you'll get a conditional pass with just make these modifications. Um, so if you can reach out to your committee members at a minimum to say, you know, can I get a sense as to what will be acceptable? I think that's going to help. And then once you get that, you know, you're at the second week of September, depending on where you're in October, set some weekly targets in terms of where you can be. Be realistic about what you can do as well. If you have external commitments, you can't get the break, you have a family, how many hours can you devote realistically to this task during this week and so forth? And I think that will make it a little bit more manageable, less anxiety, less anxiety producing, um, just to add to some of what you shared, Allison. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Well, we'll be here for you. I know that's, um, and you know, it is also possible on the other side of it that you'll be so glad it didn't get extended out to December. Right. It, that it, it actually could end up being a good thing for you. Um, here's another good question. When you speak of touching the dissertation every day, is it doing any dissertation related tasks? For example, reading articles, analyzing data, or is it more about attending to the actual written output, whether a messy draft or revising drafts? Well, that's a really good question. Honestly, for, I was thinking of it, it's okay to do anything. Right. However, right. if that doing anything starts to become a little bit of a way of a get out of jail free, get out of the guilt, not that I want you to feel guilty, but it starts to become an avoidance strategy of the writing, you need to be mindful of that. But I do think there are days where touching it would be reading an article, doing some analysis, um, transcribing, doing some coding, whatever it is, whatever that, whatever it is that you're doing, um, just be mindful if that's actually starting to become a strategy to avoid the writing. And there is something to be said though for when we are in a tight and place, a, a place of struggle with our writing, that we get ourselves to do a little bit of writing every day. I've said this many times in the writing retreats. I think most of us have had the experience of, we told ourselves we were going to run on the treadmill, but, but running on a treadmill sucks for most of us. So we go, all right, you know what? I'll just do five minutes. And then after the five minutes, you're, it's like, oh, you know what? I'll just keep going. And sometimes the touching is a way of saying, I will just do, um, I'll just do, I'll just write two sentences. Um, because sometimes we need to engage in the process of writing, um, to a point where we want, we have to move through that warm up phase. We have to move through that space of resistance. It's like there's a force field around the writing and we have to learn that we have to bust through it and we're not going to feel like writing. You know, wouldn't it be wonderful if we woke up in the morning and it was like, you know, we were in Cinderella and all the birds were flying around us and they handed us our pen and got the paper out for us. And it was like, we're just like bounding along, so excited to write, right? But that is not usually how it goes, you know? So knowing, yeah, resisting writing is something that happens to me. And how do I manage the resistance? Does the, does the, does the resistance manage me, right? So it's kind of like, um, do I have resistance or does the resistance have me? And when it has you, it's in control of you. 
and, um, and you can't get yourself to write. When you recognize, oh, I'm having the experience of resistance to writing. Oh, okay. Well, I could actually write and be resistant. They're not mutually exclusive. That's really powerful when people start to realize I can be scared, I can feel overwhelmed, I can feel anxious, I can feel stupid, I can feel like an imposter, and yet I can boldly and courageously step forward in the direction of my ultimate goal, even though I feel that way. I don't have to wait for these feelings and sensations in my body to vacate the system before I can take action. So um, when I see that you are very kindly giving each other some nice suggestions here, and I, which I really appreciate. Um, that's great. Thank you. Thank you for doing that for each other. Um, Kevin, anything you want to add about touching the work and how you talk with your clients about touching it, attending to it regularly? Yeah, sure. I, I, to the point that you made, right? Because sometimes the, um, what I call the mechanical things that we do is sometimes is a way for us to sort of be distracted from writing the anxieties that we have around sitting and writing. So we'll say, well, at least I'm working on it. All right. But the truth is there's a lot of mechanical things that are involved in writing a dissertation, right? You got to run the lit searches. You got to transcribe the data. You got to code it or crunch SPSS or that type of thing. But it's just learning the art of sort of uh, balancing and managing it. I think it was a few weeks back, Allison, you gave this example, um, which resonated with me and I still continue to use it with some of the clients. It's you know, learning how to separate yourself, if you would, right? There's the you that's doing the work and then there's sort of you, the coach over here, where you have to remind yourself that, you know, this thing that you're doing and saying that you're touching it, you're not really touching it, right? And if you could somehow be in both of those spaces where you're mindful of yourself and your behavior and the things that you, you're doing, I think that that's gonna ultimately serve you in terms of making the determination as to, am I really touching it? Or is my coach saying to me, you know that this is a waste of time or you're doing it to be, just to give yourself the impression that you're engaged. Yes, exactly. The illusion, the illusion of productivity. Right. Which is that we often do this thing where we're sort of on the periphery, working around the boundaries of the work, but we're not actually just diving in, right? You know, um, I've used this metaphor many times about the swimming pool, that when a pool or the ocean is a temperature that is uncomfortable to get into, we have a tendency to do this thing where we go down the stairs or we walk into the ocean and we slowly wade in. And it's actually very painful to do that. And um, I learned that like, um, like, I'm extremely sensitive to the temperature. Like I need water to be like really warm for me to just get right in. And I've learned like when we've gone on beach trips with the kids, I just need to go from the shore and run right into the ocean. I, if I do that thing where I wade in slowly, it's extremely painful for me. And it's so much better. It's like a little bit of a shock to the system of like, <gasps> when you first get into the water, but then you're fine. So <clears throat> I do also think about, I mean, I encourage you to think about how do you set yourself up for the transition from not, not writing, not working to writing and working? so that you leave yourself in a position the night before or the day before of knowing what your writing goals are for the next day. Maybe write a warm up sentence, maybe leave a few notes that tell you, we, sometimes we call them the trail of breadcrumbs, leave yourself that trail of breadcrumbs. And there is a way in which you want to take a deep breath and gather yourself and kind of imagine, just like you might just dive right into a pool or run right into the water, that you're doing that it's kind of like you're asking yourself to move more quickly in a way outrun all the thoughts, emotions, and body sensations that are having you wade in or hang out on the edge and not actually get in the water. Now, of course, it's also helpful if you think through what are the kinds of things that warm up the pool for me so it's not so darn hard for me to get in. You know, leaving that trail of breadcrumbs coaching yourself, giving yourself small specific assignments, lowering your standards for the quality of work, reminding yourself, you know what? I can tolerate ambiguity. 
I can tolerate uncertainty. One of the reasons, by the way, that we become so anxious and that we also and that we procrastinate is because we need to expand our tolerance of ambiguity, our capacity to hold space for the fact that we don't know what we're doing. And I, one thing I have pointed out in the writing retreats that I want to also acknowledge is that now here, um, you know, what are we about six months into this pandemic here, at least in the United States, you've been being asked to tolerate uncertainty and ambiguity on a scale you've never been asked before. We've always had to deal with a certain amount of uncertainty and, and uh, ambiguity in our personal lives, and maybe a little bit for the collective, but not to this extent for on a collective level as well. And so your bandwidth for tolerating ambiguity and uncertainty might feel taxed right now. Well, you know, I think it's just important to acknowledge that is that the writing requires a willingness to continue working while not knowing. Right. We don't, and we don't like that. Um, have you ever, like, you've ever had the experience of someone's trying to teach you a dance and you're not getting it. So you just give up because you don't want to perform. But the reality is if you want to learn to do that dance, you're going to have to look like an idiot for a while. You, you know, like I remember, I'm the kind of person who would take a step class, but back in the day when they had those step aerobic classes and, you know, everybody would like turn around, but I would still be the one person facing the wrong way. Like it just, the steps came slower to me, you know? Um, we have to be willing to be humble. This process, this process of being an academic researcher or really any kind of writer, to be totally honest, it will humble you. It regularly humbles me, you know? And that's okay. That doesn't mean you're not smart or you don't deserve to be here or you're not, you're not adequate, right? So anyway, it's a long answer to, to touching the work, but there's lots of things I think we can do to support ourselves. That's the key thing here is what are you doing actively to coach and support yourself? That you actually have far more power inside yourself to activate your system, to get yourself to engage um, than you might realize. And uh, that's, I mean, that's something that we in these writing retreats are really trying to create a context in which you are not just being activated by the community, but that you're recognizing how you activate yourself, you know, throughout the process. Um, um, oh, Kevin, I do have an, um, another question for you that I want to ask you that I just remembered, which is your advice for students who are getting contradictory feedback, either from different people on the committee or the same person gave you feedback in September, who two months from now gives you feedback that completely contradicts what they said before. Um, because I think that's a problem a lot of our clients have is how to sort out and move forward when the feedback seems inconsistent, contradictory, um, and they don't know which way to go. Excellent question. The latter scenario, I think, typically comes from a committee member who's not reading, right? And so they gave you one thing because they hadn't read it the first time. They finally have gotten around to reading it. And so this is where you sort of have to then, this is part of learning how to manage um, that specific person on your committee, right? And it might require some of what you described earlier, where you're starting to delineate things with specific dates. On this date, you gave me this feedback. On this date, you're saying this, and it seems to be contrary to what you previously said, stated, which puts them on the hook some. Mm -hmm. For the committee members, now that happens for a number of different reasons, which makes it a little tricky to navigate, right? Because in some instances, you think you're dealing with adults who can work out their differences, but in many instances, they engage in passive aggressive type things where <laughs> I'm going to take out my view of this person indirectly on your work, right? 
um, when I was working on my uh, PhD many moons ago, I, there was a common problem. Eventually I had to get rid of one committee member because I realized I had one person who was a staunch Marxist, Mar Marxist and the other who just resented anything that was <laughs> Marxism. And how that played out was in my dissertation, right? I think you need to have this Marxist theory here. And this other person is like, that's a dumb idea, that, 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 that. And I didn't learn until much later that this was really what was at play from an, another committee member who says, this is unfortunate, but they're really fighting and they're doing it uh, as it relates to you. So I think the trick here is to figure out why that might be occurring. Mm. And you're always going to need to give, I think, greater deference to the more senior person on your committee, be it the person who's characterized as chair or advisor, because ultimately they're the one who has to approve it. Um, how that, I don't have a precise way in terms of how that plays out, um, because this is gonna vary by institution, vary by whether or not you're online versus face-to-face. -face. And so I haven't really come up with a specific way to deal with that, um, but I can confirm that it's really, really a common issue that comes up, unfortunately, all too, for, uh, uh, all too frequently. Yeah, I think I would encourage you, don't try to navigate that alone. Right. Get counsel, you know, talk to peers. Maybe you have, there's a trusted faculty member, um, you know, uh, about what, how you can move forward. And sometimes it is a matter of changing committee member. Um, sometimes it's a matter of uh, politely pointing out something that is contradictory or asking um, your chair to help you navigate contradictory feedback. Unless of course your chair is the one who's involved in it and is not willing to see another way. But I think we need to get, definitely get counsel, stay calm. Um, one of the attitudes that we encourage our clients to hold, or it's really sort of a tenant I would say, is um, choose to believe that every problem has a solution and work the problem, don't let the problem work you. So many of our clients over the years have gotten completely freaked out, totally overwhelmed. The problem is working them. And now they have said and done things that they cannot undo. So when you are, if you are ever upset, frustrated with contradictory feedback or anything that's going on, don't send an email from that state of upset. Because you could, you could we, we have had a few clients who have paid dearly for doing that. Um, even to the point of actually leaving their program. Um, but just to remember, like, if you've got contradictory feedback, there is a solution, you just don't know what it is yet. And it's gonna be a matter of calmly, thoughtfully, systematically finding a way to resolve that. And that might look, that might look a variety of different ways. Allison, it might play out a little bit different sometimes. I, I don't wanna sort of have the people who are in the traditional space whose situation might be a little bit different, right? So in some instances, you might have a chair slash advisor, a methodologist, and maybe a subject matter expert of sorts, right? And they yes. don't always interact with each other, which also creates some of this challenge. A methodologist may have one view you have been working with, the chair for a while or the advisor for a while, and the methodologist comes in on the back end and is now telling you that whatever the chair had kind of guided you in terms of the chapter three or wherever your section is, is incorrect. So it plays out that way. And I think in that, in that context, you could still use some of what um, you're describing, Allison, in terms of maybe speaking with your peers and others or the extent to which there are other people in the space, online space, that you could say, hey, I'm having these challenges. In some instances, you might have an advisor, advisor who's not a part of your committee might be able to provide some support there as well. Absolutely, and, you, and that's a big part of what we do is provide support to people who need to figure out how to make sense of all the different feedback that you're getting. And you know, sometimes you'll have someone on the committee who conveys their feedback in a way that's hard to take in. Whether it's very intense, it's very strong, it's, um, it comes across as kind of judgmental where you, they're like, it feels like they're telling you you're an idiot when meanwhile your chair the whole time is like, this is great, this is great. And then you feel shocked about why is the methodologist, for example, ripping apart what you've come up with. Like that's a situation where you wanna stay calm and try to get down to 
what is really being asked of you and separate that out from the manner in which it's being said and the way it's landing with you. I think sometimes also feedback looks overwhelming and terrifying and contradictory and confusing, but when we really sit down with it and distill out the essence of what's being asked, we realize, oh, I can do this. Or they have a point, you know, I hadn't thought about it that way before. Oh, you know what? They're actually foreseeing a problem that I had not thought of. But it, sometimes it's hard to see that because the way that the feedback is given is kind of in a package where it's like with knives and daggers out. <laughs> it's not particularly kind. You know, there's no acknowledgement of the work, that investment of time and energy and thought that went into the work. There's just a statement of all the things they see that are wrong with it. Um, all right. Well, thank you so much, Kevin, first of all, to you for spending all this time with us this morning and to all of you who came today and asked great questions. And, um, you know, we love to be able to um, uh, support all of you um, in your own process and your own journey, because it is, as Kevin said in the very beginning, this is a journey, you know, and, and, um, and I think one of the most important things that we want you to know is you have the capacity to show up and support yourself through that journey and where needed to ask others to support you as well because it is a lonely journey and we need each other we need we need support to make it through this process in some form or another i hope you all have a wonderful day and on behalf of everybody at the academic writer space we're you know we're so happy to have you here and answer your questions and we look forward to seeing you at our next live q a next month all right thanks everybody Okay. Bye. Thank you. Mm -hmm.